Well, thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just try and do four things. First of all, I want to try and get across the message that at the moment in biomedicine and drug discovery, there is an incredible amount of duplication and wastage. Secondly, what I'd like to do is to share with you an increasing concern that a lot of published literature is not reproducible, especially data on animal models. Thirdly, I'll comment on what we're doing. And fourthly, I'll comment on what we're planning on doing. So firstly, with respect to this duplication and wastage in biomedical research and drug discovery. So let me give you two stories. Firstly, back in 97, I was working in a company called Glaxo Welcome. I was working on a target, a protein, it's called TRIP-V1, the name doesn't really matter. And I was interested in it as a potential treatment for pain, as an analgesic. In 1999, my friend John Davis, he generated an animal model where he removed this protein from birth. And that in those animals, they seemed to have less pain. So the protein wasn't there, so they had less pain. So everybody concluded that if we block this protein, we will get an analgesic. In 2000, the whole pharmaceutical industry jumped on that target as a target for pain. In 2003, when I was now in GlaxoSmithKline, we generated a molecule which actually blocked that protein, and we took it into the clinic, into patients, and it wasn't analgesic, and in fact, it caused an increase in body temperature, a hyperthermia. That was 2003. In 2006, there were still 60 companies working on that target. Middle of 2010, I was chairing a meeting in London, and there were still academics, biotechs, and pharma working on that target. And then, December 2010, AstraZeneca published their clinical data. There was no analgesia with their own molecule. There was no analgesia, and there was an increase in body temperature. Now, just imagine in 13 years how much money, how many people's careers, and importantly, how many patients were wasted. Because all these companies with their own molecules were dosing patients with molecules that are destined for failure. Ethically and morally, that is wrong. The second example I'd like to give you is with respect to Alzheimer's. Now, in Alzheimer's, a hypothesis that many of us have been working on for now 29 years is that a protein called amyloid accumulates in the brain, and this is what causes cognitive decline and dementia and loss of memory, etc. So everybody has been trying to in stop the production of this protein or increase the breakdown of this protein or increase its removal from the brain. I was at a meeting in Washington on Monday and Tuesday, organized by the NIH. And all the public funders all over the world are starting to get into a real panic about Alzheimer's. Because frankly, we are not even close to having a treatment. Paul Ason, who's a leading scientist, works in California, he said, 400 molecules hitting amyloid have been tr shown to work in animal models. Not one has worked in the clinic. 29 years we've worked on that hypothesis. Together, in academia, in biotech, and in pharma, we have spent in excess of $30 billion. Billion dollars. And we still don't know the answer. Everybody's asking, what form of amyloid do we need to inhibit? Where in the brain do we need to inhibit it? When do you need to give the drug to the patients? And if you do inhibit it, is it going to have any benefit in patients? 29 years and $30 billion later, we still don't know the answer because all these companies are doing their own experiment internally, in parallel, in secret. Just imagine the money, careers, and patients. So what have we learned from all of this? What we've learned is that in early discovery, 
all this competition, all this secrecy, all this obsession with IP, and lack of publication, or lack of speedy publication, is wasting money, is wasting people's careers, and importantly, is harming patients. And we are desperate for new treatments for Alzheimer's. In the UK, 2050, 29% of people in the UK will be over the age of 65. Nearly one in three. And of course, over the age of 65, the prevalence of dementia, of cancer, of cardiovascular disease goes up almost exponentially. I was in Japan a few weeks ago, and that number in Japan is 41%. Alzheimer's, unless we get a treatment soon, is going to cripple many societies financially. The second comment I'd like to make about is this re lack of reproducibility of data, in particular animal models. And again, this came up at this meeting on Monday, Tuesday in Washington. Now, I don't think this lack of reproducibility is malicious or it's deliberate. I think a lot of it is because of limited funds in labs, pressure to publish, but also primarily due to the complexity of biology. I think that's the main reason. Now, what was suggested is that just like clinical data, whenever you do a clinical trial, you have to register it on clinicaltrials.gov, where you actually say what that trial is going to look like, how you're going to do the statistics, how you're going to blind the data, etc. Everybody's now saying we should do the same for animal models. Personally, I'm less concerned about animal models because I feel they have limited utility in drug discovery. I think they are overused. I think they are useful for testing hypotheses. They may be useful for getting some idea of safety and therapeutic index or exposure. But animal models are not useful for identifying new targets that we can take into the clinic because they do not predict clinical efficacy. The third comment was, OK, so what are we doing about it? So the Structural Genomics Consortium, one of my colleagues, Lee, is sitting here. We're about 100 people here in Oxford. What we've decided to do is the following. We only work on novel human proteins that we think are therapeutically relevant. And for those proteins, we generate reagents. Proteins, assays, structures, inhibitors, antibodies. And we make all of these reagents freely available. We give them, a to give them away to any academic, any biotech, any pharma. Because we believe that's the best thing we can do to facilitate science and therefore facilitate drug discovery. Let me just give you some metrics. We have done more than 1,600 structures. We do about four or five structures every month. Bear in mind there are some labs here in Oxford that do one structure every two or three years. That's the sort of throughput we have. We can do them cheaper and faster than probably any lab on the planet. We generated a structure of another membrane protein early last year. Now, many membrane protein structures are phenomenally difficult to get. People have got Nobel Prizes for these. We got a structure of a membrane protein last year in May. We immediately put it onto our website. We immediately talked about it at meetings. We even started collaborating with external scientists. That paper was published in Science last week. So almost a year later, it was published. So if anybody says you can't publish in high-impact journals when you're working pre-competitively, that's rubbish. We now have become a hub for academia. We've become a hub for innovation because we only work on new proteins, but we've become a hub for academia. You can imagine every academic who comes into my office wants to collaborate with us because they know Lee and I have got no secrets. We share all of our reagents, share all of our know-how, share all of our expertise. And academics are desperate for new reagents. We've also become a hub for pharma. We've now got eight large pharmaceutical companies that have each given us $8 million. We've got $64 million of private funding 
to do pre-competitive research. And we've got a queue of other companies waiting to join. And now we're starting to become a hub for enterprise. Because of Lee's hard work, many of our academic collaborators are using our reagents and some of the data we've generated together to now start new biotechs. Pre-competitive research is facilitating competitive activity. So what are we now planning on doing? Now this is a really bold experiment, but it's going to happen. We're now going to take completely new targets, generate completely new inhibitors, and we're going to take them all the way into patients, into phase two, completely in the absence of IP. We've already started this experiment in cancer, with Cancer Research UK. We're about to start this experiment in neuropsychiatry. The Canadian Institute for Health Research has put $30 million on the table to kick this off. And on Wednesday, I was asked to lead a discussion in Washington about should we do this in Alzheimer's. And the answer is absolutely yes. When something is difficult, when something is long-term, when something is too expensive and it's becoming even more expensive, and when something is high risk, it makes complete sense. We pool our resources, we share that risk, we break down the boundaries that are slowing down collaboration, and IP is one of them. We quickly access global academia, we access quickly patient groups, and we access quickly regulators. That's what we're going to do. This is the only way we're going to get a drug for Alzheimer's. I said on Wednesday that coming up with a new drug for Alzheimer's is harder than coming up... It's, uh, sorry, I said it's easier to put somebody on the moon than it is to come up with a new drug for Alzheimer's. And actually, if I was being probably more honest, I think it's probably about as hard as to get a drug for Alzheimer's as it is to put somebody on Mars. This is not a trivial problem that we're playing with. So in summary, I think that this way of open science will drive rigor, it will reduce wastage, it will save patients from being harmed, it will generate targets which industry can then translate into new medicines, so industry benefits, and of course, patients will benefit because they will get new drugs. Thank you very much.